it's our immense, immense pleasure to now introduce our next guest, uh, Thomas Saraceno. I met Thomas um, actually under very special circumstances because around 99, to the very beginning 2000, I was uh, invited by uh, Marco De Micheles and Angela Vitese to, to teach in Venice and uh, at the UAF, at, at the university. And I had never taught in my life before. I was always a curator. So I was absolutely nervous. It was the first day you know, of me teaching. I didn't really know what I would tell the students. Um, and I arrived in the classroom uh, and something amazing happened because I didn't have to say much because there was this amazing student who had just arrived from Argentina to, to Venice and then later to the Shell Schule in uh, Frankfurt called Thomas Saraceno. And uh, Thomas told us amazing stories. It became a truly memorable seminar and a great example that the professor always learns most, you know, from the students. Um, and well, not only that, but Thomas immediately upon arriving in, um, in Venice wanted to go and see the mayor. We had uh, to arrange a meeting for him with the mayor because he said this is really important because he said that we need to learn how to build in the air because Venice is a city which is built on water, but he wanted to teach Venice how to build in air. And um, that was the beginning of many great adventures uh, uh, of really realized utopias which uh, Thomas is, uh, is building. In his very first kind of you know, encounter, he also told our group about a visionary from Argentina called Gyula Kosice, whom I would like to remember here tonight. The great Gyula Kosice who passed away almost 100 years old, a few, a few years ago, uh, was a visionary Argentinian artist, co-founder of, co of the Mardi Group, I think, who very much is connected to the theme of what we're discussing here today, because it was all about gravity, how to transcend gravity, how to build entire cities which would go beyond gravity. And that's, of course, what Thomas has been doing for so many years, inventing cloud cities, inventing airport cities, you know, which would float. And uh, many of these experiments have recently been gathered in an amazing exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo called Carte Blanche to Thomas Saraceno, where this exhibition on air could be experienced at the Palais de Tokyo as a whole ecosystem, you know, hosting lots of different choreographies, polyphonies. Uh, and not only was it a great experience of really bringing art, science, engineering together, but it also became one of the most visited, most popular shows of the year, and I think had 200,000 visitors. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Thomas Saraceno. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Thank you to be here. Um, I thought it's good to uh, maybe start with a movie uh, after having this fantastic lunch. Uh, who want to sleep? Who sleep? <laughs> Even we maybe turn down the light a little bit further, then maybe I fall asleep also. After Thomas Hirschhorn sees his beautiful uh, performance where people sleep in the couch and feel comfortable, it was very beautiful and inspiring. Um, now, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know why is the reason, but to a certain extent, um, and also during lunch, there is a certain uh, level of uh, not me being prepared and being here and being able to give a talk and give you a speech, which I don't know why um, I like to confront myself to a certain high level of um, danger uh, or, or insecurity or why I cannot put the slide together. The presentation that I will put up is like, a, I never have seen it, you know, I keep changing. You know, and then people from Berlin keep sending and the text keep collecting and then, you know, it's full of notes and I don't know what will happen. Uh, and this mean it, it, it made me extremely um, nervous. Um, and this mean, I thought to calm down a little bit, I, I thought to, to put two things together that as I said before, um, hopefully will resonate or, or this moment of, of grace, uh, it will happen um, and see what happens. This mean I will be playing a video and then I will be reading a text and I will try to uh, see if there is a kind of a relationship among them. Uh, as always, I have uh, more or less 400 slides. I should not forget <laughs> the, 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 the timing there. And uh, I lost some minutes, otherwise I will 
But okay, somebody help me with the timing and to leave uh, time for the question. And maybe I thought to start right from the, um, somebody asked me when I came out from the lunch, and, and I will try to answer the question of Hans right at the beginning, the unrealized project. This means there was a small, beautiful uh, bag here. Maybe you borrowed me. Uh, yeah, beautiful. They asked me to uh, design something for the, for the bag. And the original design, this means it became an unrealized project because it's partially here, but not yet, but we could maybe start to build it, was the idea to, this is a spider web, but I said it's supposed to be inside. This means the outside should be supposed to be nothing, and then you open the bag and you're a spider web, it's like, ooh, and you don't want to put anything inside. <laughs> this means, I thought, um, you know, maybe I can start like a, tried to do it because we said, but maybe we can just turn upside down the bag and then the spider web then will be inside, at least partially. This means if whoever wants to do it, it will be in your hands to realize the project that we start to think it might be possible by turning it upside down. Um, uh, then, um, can we really um, uh, slide down the light because it's kind of uh, very, very strong here? even less, I want to disappear. <laughs> you don't see me, less, less, ooh, this one. Okay, the, the, um, the project is, what I want to talk mostly is about, uh, um, ah, yeah, that was the first slide, um, uh, about Erosin, and this is what I will focus most about it, the talk and the, what I will be, uh, Reading and this means the reading is really kind of a collection of essays which have been um, around a group of people that we call uh, the Irocene. and this means it's, it's really kind of a um, you know I'm, I'm trying to uh, be part of, of of something which is a little bit beyond uh, um, uh, my own practice and try to really think how we can influence uh, one to each other, how we can try to think together, how we can try to write together, uh, how we can fail together and. Uh, how we can try to uh, articulate uh, something which might be among the different disciplines and the, and the way of how we could think about. Um, Falling Upward is the title of a book, um, I forgot the author, and, uh, and then We Live at the Bottom of Ocean of Air is also a, a, a sentence by Torricelli, a student of Galileo, um, that I kind of put them together. Uh, Grace is the absence of gravity feeling you falling. This is me, I change a little bit of quote that uh, uh, Hans put it to the, today, and then I thought the feeling was something more appropriate. Gravis, ah, okay, then with the astrophysic, which um, was present before, this is something which I always kind of, it's beautiful, and I think so, it's true, you, could, you, uh, you can fact check afterward, but gravity is the weakest force in the universe, but at the same time, it's the more abundant. This is, I mean, it's, it's something, um, thanks to gravity that we can think about black matter and dark energy and how things and bodies comes together. This means I love this idea that is the weakest but the more abundant. This means there is this kind of contradiction about both which I kind of uh, quite like it. Um, let me see if I can play that video. Let's see if it, the sound appears. Yeah, there we are. Okay, um, I will sit a little bit. <laughs> okay. A bit louder, if possible, the sound. scientist Alexander Chechensky believed that every 11 years at the beginning of each new solar cycle, major historical events occur. His thought was that since it changed the sun activity appearance have an effect in space, the atmosphere and the earth's surface, the new as the rest of organisms my English is terrible. <laughs> And I don't know what I'm reading. <laughs> okay, try it again. Then we, as terrestrial organisms, are not exempt from this effect. 
we gather a large amount of data, he gather a large, large amount of data, observing a historical relation between the highest level of sovereign activity and the mass revolution of movement. This idea must apply also to a smaller scale where temperature is the finest measure of the average molecular motion. Okay, it's getting complicated, no? But he did something which is quite amazing, no? He said, like, every 11 years, the sun is getting closer to, to the Earth. And I mean, what he finds, that there is always this kind of correlation between the revolution of planet Earth in relationship with this 11 period time, periodicity. And I mean, and usually also, the revolution that has happened is from the left side also, to that extent. And this means what we are trying to do here is an experiment in the University of Chicago that we kind of have these kind of very high um, frequencies and we make levitate particles and these particles are cosmic dust. It's not terrestrial dust, but it's dust who come from outer space. And this means what we are trying with this frequency based on this kind of uh, what are the rhythms of this uh, revolution, what might happen, how planet might be able to assemble according with these different rhythms thinking that also the planet had been forming and we started as a cosmic dust to a certain extent. And now we play this one. Okay, this video is in white sand. Uh, yeah, I think it lasts like five or six minutes. White sand is, is in the States is the place where it was the first atomic explosion. Uh, this is, I mean, is one of the markets of the beginning of the age of the Anthropocene, where these very tiny particles have kind of spread all over the world, and now you can find the strata in different places around the world. And this is why some of them, they think, okay, it might be, what is the materiality of the beginning of the Anthropocene, where humans live? And that's the point of the talk, when human lives. That, I think, is so the most problematic point of the Anthropocene. We cannot generalize, and we are not all the same. I mean, what I always try to do in the talk is like some human. The ability to put some before the humans, I think, is crucial. I just arrived yesterday night and I said, well, you know, I'm in the middle of the mountain. There are people here living in Switzerland who are very well attuned and they are not responsible of what is happening today in the planet Earth. I mean, there is this kind of divergence between a re responsibility. What is your ability to respond? As Elisabeth Stenger has put it also, to the crisis that we are living, that not all are producing this crisis, but most of us, I think, so, um, are suffering the consequence. And I mean, this idea of the human putting everything in one single baggage, I think is very problematic to that extent. I mean, every time I've made a mistake at all, humans as a generalization, I think so, I will always try to stop and then say to some, just to the shake of, try to um, think how we can um, think differently. Okay, well, fossil fuel-based industry try to colonize other planets. The air, the interface between us and the sun is controlled by few. A bit lower. Um, and continue to compromise. Carbon emission fill the air. Particular matters float inside our lungs, while electromagnetic radiation envelops the air, dictating the tempo of digital capitalism in the era of global warming. Irosin proposed an epoch of interplanetary sensitivity, sensitivity, bringing a new ecology of practice, asking how we can, how will be to breathe in a post-fossil fuel economy, and what is our response ability to be on air? How do we challenge social political borders in an age of climate inequality? How to practice in an epoch beyond the Anthropocene toward the decarbonization of the air and towards the independence from fossil fuel? We propose a new epoch called the Irosin. Heliocene imagines space as a commons and becomes a physical and imaginary place clear from com uh, corporate control and governmental surveillance. Heliocene proposed the desecularization, free access to the atmosphere, the last, end, uh, the last earthly layer created as a result of the interplanetary forces of the sun, gravity, and the earth mass. Heliocene is a proposal, a scene in, on, for, and with the air. The launch path toward this new epoch is an aerosolar balloon. A do it together entrance to the aerial, whose imagined is only the air and the heat of the sun. And it floats as a result of the temperature, uh, the temperature differential between the two air masses, anywhere from two degrees to up. This means, if you have seen, there is no kind of really magic. And you saw the two persons before, Daniel and Dania. Here we are in white sand, and this 
first of the um, atomic bomb explosion. It's just like it was a matter of kind of running. I thought today also maybe the lecture should have been completely different because it was beautiful sunny outside. And, um, and when it's sunny and there is little wind, uh, right in front of the square now it's got a little bit um, uh, in the shadow. But uh, if you want tomorrow morning, we could experience. This is mean, for me, that, what, what I'm talking is very, very simple. It's like a, how you can, and this, this moment of grace and reversing gravity, which is very, very beautiful, I think so. Uh, one is, once inflated with air, they are able to elevate into the sky, start only to the sun, heating in the air, and say, so after what rewarding, only the wind in order to drift air, so it journeys. And without the use of fossil fuel and without releasing any harmful particles. Uh, okay. In such a way, it called for a new embodied cosmology attuned with the sun, the life giving star that had been turned into a threat by clouds of black carbon that absorb solar energy and make our planet warmer every day. In this way, the Erosine Epoch becomes a weather dependent building, a less anthropocentric relationship with the environment, becoming a way to exit from the epistemic isolation and re-entangle ourselves with the surrounding milieu, in this case, the weather. Floating, airborne, without carbon emission, this aerosolar journey speculate about what kind of nomadic socio-political structure might emerge if we could navigate in the river of the atmosphere, reconsidering the way in which borders are set by humans, the power of national institution to decide how can transit policies that dramatically affect vulnerable subjects, humans and non-humans animals. This is to become air nomads, moving from homo economicus to homo flotantis, who is attuned to the planetary rhythms, who in consciousness of living with other humans and non-humans, and who have learned to float in the air, drift and drift with the wind. Plants and animals suffer from climate change, losing their right to mobility, in, unable to physically escape its effects. What are the right of pass, the corridors we need to open in order to return uh, mobility to this species trapped by the fossil fuel regime propagated by some humans? Are you seeing call for the interspecies right of mobility that could reconnect with element sources of energy and with other planetary atmospheres, breaking the boundary of the sublunary and expanding the critical zone of all air dependent life? We suggest a model for a landscape that balance and, har and harness our relation with the unlimited potential of the sun. This realization requires a thermodynamic leap of imagination, just like during the eclipse, when only the absence of land, we became aware of our scale in the shadows of the cosmos. We get a little bit of, of this uh, speculation, which came most like Bronislav Sesinki, friend of Bruno Latour, when we start to think about uh, proposition of think about a monument for the Anthropocene and all the different stage of metabolic regimes that human have cross um, maybe I read it or I talk what do you prefer how many minutes we are going there oh, we are okay I talk better you go too fast okay um, this means what, what we're trying to think and then maybe I stop and we open for question because I get too crazy um, the, no, the metabolic regime is all this idea of you know humani uh, humans and or human Homo sapiens. To that extent, we have been hunter and gatherings before, no? And we will follow the seasons. We will follow um, the animals. We will follow um, um, when plants will um, um, bring fruits. We will kind of uh, we, we're nomads basically. And this means the second metabolic regime, we kind of invented agriculture and we kind of domesticate the sun to a certain extent. And then this nomadism, it kind of uh, uh, start to kind of uh, be lost uh, by the majority of, of humans living on planet Earth. And then we invented the city. It's a way of domesticating the sun, the agriculture. No? We lose this ability of, of, of nomadic life. And the third metabolic regime, we, we, we discover the, the fossil fuel regime, right? And this means a bigger conglomeration after the agriculture revolution kind of start to kind of form and the megalopolis and the way how we live today. Now the fourth metabolic regime that we argue is what if we really kind of relate differently with the sun as the way that we are relating today.
Ok, this was uh, a Mirarte is what is that? Exhibition. Okay, these are the credits, which is important. Uh, this was a worldwide record. Does it mean I think so? There were only eight persons in history of Homo sapiens on planet Earth who were able to lift up a person in the air without burning fossil fuel. And in that case, um, uh, we did it with a 35 acre. And it's, I mean, it's something very, very simple, but uh, it seems we have forgotten. It's, I mean, back in, in, in time when I was at NASA in 2009 with 120 scientists, you know what I mean? People who have, uh, you know, being at the ISS, International Space Station, they could not believe that during a weekend, two person, you can build something that you can float at the bottom of ocean of air without uh, uh, burning uh, fossil fuel or without using helium and, and hydrogen. Should we put question up or how we do? Thank you. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so very much. So we're going to take questions. Uh, do yeah. you want to sit down? Maybe it's uh, yes. we just take the chairs and uh, the more Wonderful. comfortable. Just because sometimes people confuse with the materiality. You know this project. No, this is kind of a collective part of them. It's called Museo Solar, where we collect plastic bags, right? You just tape them together. Uh, you make this gigantic canvas. You form an envelope. The sun comes from the horizon, and then it gets up into the air. This means you don't need kind of uh, certain special. <laughs> Another big round of applause for uh, uh, Thomas Saraceno. <laughs> A few questions, Thomas, before we open it up to the uh, to all the participants here. You know, I said in the uh, the introduction that you were inspired for many of these experiments yeah. by, by Gyula Kosic. Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, as Eric Hobsbawm always said, that we protest against forgetting. So the mm. memory of such pioneers is important. Uh, you know, we, I spoke earlier this morning about Panamarenko. I think it's important we think of him in relation to that theme and his flying experiments. I wanted yeah. you to tell us about Gyula Kosic, yeah. your meetings with him and yeah. his incredible visions yeah. of, of of, of cities defying gravity, yeah. really. No, there is a beautiful, popular song uh, writer, Atahualpa Yupanqui, from Argentina. Mm. Um, and since, in, you know, in many places, it's kind of an oral tradition of knowledge, no? You don't have, but every time he says, it's when an old man die in the village, it's like you will burn an entire uh, library of the form of knowledge you have. And I think so, Hans is this, um, um, a live internet connecting everybody and knowing anything from everybody. And this was said by Rax Media also, by the way. It's not something that I invented. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy that you bring back Eula um, in that extent, which was a, a quite influential person. And in the time that I was studying architecture in, in, uh, in Buenos Aires, and then I was very always fascinated by, the, by this idea of articulating. No? He was always talking about this hydrospatial city. Um, kind of uh, with the power of the levitation of you no know, the, the catalyzation of the water he will be able to to levitate these these cities in the air and he had this beautiful book uh, where he always kind of uh, speculate about um, you know in architecture you you define spaces okay this is a living room this is a bathroom this is a toilet he will have these kind of uh, maps of the a hydrospatial city, and every space, he will kind of change it in a completely uh, speculative manner. As to the extent, it's like uh, this is the space to forget um, um, the knowledge of the present and, and, and fuse with the sun. You know what I mean? A, a, with a beautiful poetic, it's, it's like, almost like a, a condensation of Italo Calvino, um, uh, invisible cities in kind of a sentence, which define the space in a, in a, you know, for me it's the moment, you know, when, when Thomas also said, it's the moment that you sleep, you know, and you forgot. Well, it's not anymore the exhibition, right? It's, a, it's kind of awareness uh, um, lost in the moment uh, that, um, I think so. It was very beautiful. When you will we talk about, about it. You know, poetry, um, sorry. We talked about poetry. You know, we talked about literature. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about science. You know, in relation to to the theme, because you had a work actually, um, which I saw in Rome at the Maxi, I think, mm. which was uh, you know these aerostatic balloons. It connects to what you mm. showed us, and was gravity imaging the universe. You know, after mm. Einstein. But you also, you know, and I was wondering, kind of, if you can tell us a little bit about that, you know, about the idea of imagining the universe after Einstein, and what's the kind of difference in our knowledge and perception of the universe 
before and mm. after Einstein? Mm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm more, more thinking about um, the question that I'm asking, and I'm asking also to the scientists, uh, to a certain extent, is um, it go beyond the human? And this I mean all the words that we do with the spiders, um, it's kind of, again, re-entangled with this form of knowledge, which I think so. For example, the question we have been doing at Palais Tokyo, and then with Lisa Randall and other people, which was kind of uh, interesting, the conversation, uh, is always, you know, for example, you know, a population in, in, in the past, in Papua New Guinea, when a tsunami was happening, um, people will know exactly the behavior of the ants, because they, the ants will feel the the shaking of the earth, and then because the tribe, they will see the ants will go up the mountain, the people living in, in that mountain, they will follow the ants, they will go up, and when a tsunami hits, nothing will happen. This is mean, what is happening in science, and this is mean, what I'm trying to ask is like, when will be the time that a non-human will, will win a Nobel Prize? And the scientists look at me, it's like, how could be? Because they're obsessive, you know what I mean, and when I talk with, do you understand the relationship? Is give the Nobel Prize to the ants because they are the best sensor ever in the world who can forecast and predict much better than all the, our technology. That is a that great to, idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is mean, and then, uh, and then, and then Lisa Randall, a very famous uh, cosmologist, said, Thomas, this is a wonderful idea, but I think so. A big leap will be if a woman uh, win a Nobel Prize first in physics. <laughs> I mean, we are quite very behind on the sensitivity of the inequality of the world we are living. And I think so there are many steps that we have to go through, through, through you know, and with genders and patriarchy. Very <laughs> urgent. The problem that we are living today on our Earth. And this, I mean, I'm putting it now with the animals, but I think so we are quite far up. But also you talked about gravitational waves, you know, and uh, uh, I wanted to go a bit deeper on that. Gravitational waves, you know, waves evoke an analogy often used by scientists, the comparison between, you know, 3D spider webs, which you had in many of your recent exhibitions, yeah. and our, you know, spongy universe with galaxies morphing into war-like sheets, leaving huge voids of nearly empty space. It connects to this idea also of the void. Can you tell us a little bit about the gravity waves? Because they were observed actually rather recently, I think 2015 or 16. Yeah. It's a recent discovery. I wanted, wanted to hear more. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I'm not the best to talk about that. But I always say, like, you know, I mean, for me, it's beautiful because we always thought that the piece at Palais Tokyo was this idea of jamming and being together. And then, uh, you know, and, and then not try to divide, you know, who is the participant of the exhibition. This means the, the text of who are the credits, I think it's were approximately, I don't know, 600 names or more. I mean, it was all the time of saying, okay, who was living at the Palais de Tokyo? And then we, the first approach was, you know, we found out that more than 600 uh, alive spiders that were living at the Palais de Tokyo for a very long time. And this means we start to pay attention to them. We decide to put microphones and we try to decide also, okay, what they're able to sense. And this means are also able to sense these kind of gravitational waves, which for me is quite inspirational because it's, it's the moment that, um, you know, time and space collapse. And this means it's really the moment that, uh, you know, when these waves pass um, uh, through you, you become very small and then you become large. It really it changed even physically your body. It's a billion of a billion of a millimeter, something uh, absurd. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, it changed these parameters of... of uh, and then I just was now in San Francisco about, uh, you know, space travel, warm time capsule and, and quantum leaps and so forth. I mean, yes, I love um, also to think about that, different uh, modes of uh, um, reality. But, uh, but I think so, you know, it's always this idea, learn to fly with a feet on the ground. I think so there is all the time this kind of, um, um, we cannot kill that imagination of, 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 of that way of thinking, but uh, there is this kind of ability to respond to a certain extent and how we can respond together to that extent that I'm curious. And I'm so much, Thomas, we can now open it up for all your questions. We've got a question here. If you can have the microphone. Thank you, Thomas. Always most Bye -bye. inspiring. Mm -hmm. For me, Aerosene is a real example of power of art that when it brings, like, like you said, you know, jamming together, mm. all of us. And mm. as you know, I was in Davos this week at the World Economic Forum, and it was a real lack of grace, and uh, it was a real lack of uh, possibilities and reimaginations of uh, a new architecture, or new structures mm. that we need to build. And I see Aerosen as a such uh, a new community. Mm. Can you share a little bit with okay. us 
more, how do you see uh, Aerosyn can be one of the potential models to building a new community mm -hmm. to bring this responsibility for uh, humanity and the planet uh, mm -hmm. forward? <laughs> it's too big a question, but uh, uh, no, in practical terms, what are, what are we trying to put up? I don't know, I'm kind of so happy. There was a beautiful article in the New York Times that finally all the people who thought uh, speculated with cryptocurrency and the tokens and all this kind of value exchange finally have gone. And then now suddenly the people who were really interested in thinking about a shared economy, you know, there will be space and, and, and space uh, and time for them to, to start to really work and, and kind of try to build up uh, something which is really uh, different of what was the, the shared economy that had been proposed. This means we are really trying to move with the Aerosyn community on kind of, to a certain extent, what we, you know, how we can kind of uh, evaluate a single contribution that each of us uh, produce within, the, within that community. And this means it's really, to a certain extent, it's kind of uh, retribute or invent this kind of token that we don't know if will be kind of exchanged for which value, but it's gonna try to, for example, collect miles and more. You know, and every time that we come up and we move, and me also, I'm kind of uh, proud to collect miles because then I can fly somewhere else. And it's completely shameful, right? In the, we call global time, and then we enter into the elite, and then suddenly I have the golden card and the platinum, and say, oh my God, you know what I mean? Look how far we have get of not really kind of be conscious about that thing. And you know that when you get flying business, when first class is, between two and three times more that if you fly an economy, the carbon emission that you are producing. This means you enter in kind of a, a, a circuit that I'm also part that is kind of completely, um, and it, you know, and this means how we can then, now with the aerosene, you know, and then we are trying to kind of have a virtual fly, a feather fly, and a free fly. Uh, and this means you have also categories as an aeroplane, you have X, Z, and you multiply according with the practice. I mean, just for give you an idea, every time we launch a free fly balloon, it's quite complicated. And this means if you do a free fly with these balloons, um, you earn five times uh, uh, miles than if you do a feather. If you do a virtual also, you earn much less. This means a, a, a free fly, you have to have an insurance of over two million euro in case you crash with an airplane. Um, <laughs> you have to translate uh, uh, the policy to every country that you will cross the airspace. This means the paperwork that you have to do to release these objects into the air is quite uh, um, um, heavy demanded. Um, and this means, but I'm happy that we are having conversation with the European Minister of Transportation of trying to open up these corridors, no? Uh, and this means really, for example, every time we launch one of these cultures from Berlin, we end up always, there is kind of a constant wind which is towards uh, Lithuania, Poland, and the border of Russia. Is, I mean, if you have a TGV, we have a kind of a constant corridors where people from transportation talk about it, that we have to kind of, kind of now start to kind of um, um, decarbonize and occupy with another more maybe civilian or artistic or embodied uh, presence, I think so, which is quite uh, important. More questions? For, we can take, I think, two or three more questions for Thomas. No more. I wanted to follow up on we this meditate question. We meditate then. But I wanted to follow up on this question, <laughs> this question from before. Thomas, the question from before. I have a follow up question on that, which is interesting. You know, because of course in Switzerland you have PICAR's initiative with the solar airplane. And yeah. uh, Olaf Eliasson, you know, works with Ottesen from Denmark on a project for a solar airplane. Have you ever looked into that? Yeah. I mean, I have a talk uh, in a space mural. When was uh, Barbara? Uh, two, three? Yeah, three, four years ago, that I have a conversation one to one with Picard. Picard was here. I was here. And I mean, it's quite astonishing how. Um, I, I try to move quickly because I mean, this is one. When, when the sun comes down, this will come down, right? This is I mean, uh, it's really solar dependent. Okay, this is the one that uh, I try to go back. I brought here to um, Zeus, uh, and tomorrow we could make a flight. Uh, this mean, these are always black, and we can do the drawings. This is when we launch it. <laughs> this is when we do the, the fly. We live in, in Berlin, approximately 600 kilometers in that case. It's very slow, my computer, that it doesn't go through. Oh, it closed the program. Anyway, the, uh, here we are. This, I mean, this is a kind of a copy of, of something that the, the French Space Agency have been doing in, starting in the 60s and end up the program in 82. Quite surprisingly, and I feel guilty not to contribute yet properly to the Wikipedia article on solar balloon, which is very, very small and niche. Picard didn't know about that. These type of balloons in 
72 and 82, they did three times around the world without burning fossil fuel and just being moved by the wind. This means, because, I mean, it's still the simplicity what I'm trying to say, and you know, it's just air and sun and an envelope. Because God crazy, I mean, we are, there's always this kick, this kind of, um, you know, you, where is the battery? There's no battery. The battery is the, the planet Earth. This means during the day, it flies for approximately 40 kilometers heated by the sun, but the sun will come down, what it heat up the air, which is inside it? The Earth, the balloon come down to 20 kilometers, pick up the infrared radiation, is the temperature, you know, when you touch the asphalt till during the evening, this heat goes back and then stabilizes at 20, then goes up. And it means a beautiful choreography of movement of these sculptures who could travel around the world. And it means they stop it, they don't fly anymore because the Earth says more populated policy legislation and things, and Picard didn't know about that thing. Is mean, you know, and then we open up in the Grand Palais, we show two of these pieces during the uh, COP21 when Paris was signed the agreement, and I cannot hope and wait that this type of uh, forgotten type of technology again kind of uh, bring it back. We have a question in the front row, if you can have the mic, and then a question from Svetlana, can you have the question, the microphone to the front uh. row? Thank you. Uh, how closely are you working with um, the academia and environmentalists, or how is that a cooperation with these, well, interdisciplinary methods, but particularly, I imagine, not only working with scientists, but advancing this for other people as well that are in yeah. the same kind of research, yeah. and equally with policy makers? Yeah. Well, it is a mix, you know, I mean, we have people, and I don't think from Pablo Suarez, from Red Cross is a long term collaborator, we have been in a couple of places. Pablo always takes his backpacks everywhere it goes, and it's been that he's, uh, from that extent, uh, uh, something with Red Cross. Then we work with uh, Nick Shapiro, which is part of a, um, a public lab, which I think so is one of the, the, high, the, the biggest environmental justice uh, community in the world. I think so, approximately 7,000 scientists who really kind of make grassroots uh, movement on trying to battle uh, people who suffer. Uh, you know. Uh, no, it's public lab. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a community of people who work about uh, environmental justice thing, and then they kind of build sensor uh, uh, when people start to sense that something is wrong with the environment. And this means you know people living near areas where fracking is happening, um, and then people start to have high degrees of cancer, and they don't know what is happening. They don't know what's happening. They call public lab, seven thousand team up together. They say well, it's usually sensor to start to. Measure these particular matters in the air is very expensive, over 200,000 euros. And it's been people in the community, they cannot build that sensor. And they call public lab, and this means it's called by the man, right? It's in public lab, they hack and they crack that sensor, they give it back to the community, and they get it all the data required, and then they can, they can fight the case toward the companies which are producing something we don't know yet that it might be harmful for humans. And this mean that's the way that we do. This means we kind of, you know, with different. Um, 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 and then, you know, mostly now we're um, um, Violeta Bulk, which is the, uh, your sister, Barbara, friend, cousin, <laughs> uh, 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 of the European Minister of Transportation on trying to deal with that thing. It's been, you know, it, it kind of go uh, very um, diverse. Sometimes we deal with architecture and sometimes with art and, uh, yeah, whoever wants to participate is, is welcome. We're out of time, but there is a urgent last question yeah. from Svetlana, if you can have the mic. Here, and then one very short question and short answer. Thank sure. you. What do you think if we could overcome gravity and experience space without moving by contemporary in future knowledge of quantum physics, virtual reality and telepathy? Yeah. But look, I tell you something which is very beautiful. Santos Dumont and, and some other, what, the very beautiful work. Uh, you are experiencing something which is called stillness in motion. I will answer your question tangentially. I have to hurry up. Okay. Stillness in motion. When you move um, in a hot air balloon which have a burner, you always have a speed of ascension. Usually it's like 50 meters per second. Uh, when you are in a car, when you are in a bicycle, when you are in a windsurf, or you have also something which have fr uh, friction against. When you are in a solar balloon and, and you are not feathered, you move with the wind, and you become the wind. It's called stillness in motion. You don't feel anymore that you're moving because you became the wind. This means frictionless. And I mean, it's quite, quite beautiful because uh, you could be moving, you see just 
couple of few meters down there, a tree shaking. <laughs> and then you are in the balloon in an open gondola, and I can be talking with Hans, and this hair will not move one millimeter. And then your brain cannot reconcile. It's like, how the hell is very windy down there? But you are the wind. And it's been that's, you know, the jam that we are trying to think, you know, it's like, how, you know, the wind stopped to be there, because you are the wind. And that's the stillness in motion movement that we are trying to speculate. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. A big applause for Thomas Saraceno.